Good afternoon and happy Resurrection Sunday. You're watching yours truly, Sterling March. And this is my podcast, Kingdom Road, where we teach the correct interpretation of the Kingdom of God. And I want to say again, happy Resurrection Sunday. And our teaching is going to be about exactly that, with a leading of it from Good Friday. So we're going to teach about Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. I should probably should have taught Good Friday on Good Friday. But I wanted to do both today so you can see how they are related to each other. I think that's a good way to do it. You know. But as you know, we got a lot of information. So we're not going to tarry too long. We're going to get right into it. And I just want to ask you to please share. Those of you who are writing me, I need you to share. Please, please share. And, um... Like I say, we're going to go right into it. There's a lot of important information. You don't need to take anything down. You can watch this as many times as you want to on my Facebook page, um, Kingdom Road with yours truly, the correct interpretation of the Kingdom of God, or on my YouTube channel, Sterling March, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G-M-A-R-C-H. Okay, and then it will appear shortly on that channel, about an hour after this show. Okay, so let's go. The real reason for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. The events that occurred on those two occasions are celebrated all around the world. And they should be. One is the most selfless act ever performed in history and it's not even close. The other represents the offering of the greatest gift ever given by the greatest giver that there has ever been. Let's review what made them so significant individually. Though they are internally connected, individually they both carry a unique significance. So we're going to begin now with Good Friday. Good Friday was by necessity the first part of God's process for the reconciliation of man, which simply means the return of man to him, to the status he had given him in Adam before the fall. Okay? People sometimes forget man was not what he was, always was, after the fall. Man was something else before the fall. He was something special. Okay? And making Adam just like him, he gave him the power of a God by breathing God the Spirit into him, making him a living soul. Anybody with a living soul is a God. Okay? A disposition only held by gods or sons of God, <coughs> excuse me, through this disposition any man could wield dominion power as long as he didn't sin. And if he did, only atonement by one just like him before the sin would be qualified to pay the unblemished penalty of death required for sin. Because of the law that said the wages of sin is death. That law was stated to Adam in another way when he when God told Adam if you eat from this tree meaning if you sin against me you shall surely die that was that law the wages of sin is death it became the wages of sin is death okay so no one in the Old Testament could receive reconciliation while they were alive as we can now because no one on earth was qualified to pay the price for sin permanently you see in order for man to receive God's salvation someone has to pay the price for his sin permanently the, the Israelites in the Old Testament could receive an atonement for a temporary redemption but they couldn't receive salvation because number one they didn't believe and number two an animal was not sufficient enough as a price to pay for the way for the sin of man an animal is it's just an animal a man a sinless man was needed to pay the price for the sinless man who caused sin to go come onto the world and that was Adam Adam was sinless he was a God so a sinless man which is a God automatically had to pay the price for sin for man so that he could once again be returned to God okay like I say and I've just almost repeated what I just said just now. Good Friday, as performed by the Christ, was the reenactment of the original killing of the animal in the Garden of Eden. 
Remember when God killed the animal and gave him its skins? For Adam's transgression, Adam and Eve, and the Passover performed in Egypt by God for the Israelites. That's what Good Friday was. Good Friday is a repeat originally of the killing of the animal that God did for Adam and Eve. And remember he gave them the clothes, the, the skin for its clothing. That was atonement being made for them. That's what that animal was for. That wasn't just for, when the Bible says clothes, it's not talking about clothes. It's talking about clothed in grace or mercy. Okay, that's what it means. And it says he clothed them. He clothed them in his mercy through that sacrifice of that animal. That was the first redemption. Okay? And the Good Friday was, that was the original Good Friday, you could say. But it may not have been on a Friday, but that was the original act that Christ came to redo. So what Christ did on Good Friday was not new. Okay? It was done from in the Garden of Eden, but with an animal. And that's why he had to come and do what he did, because an animal just wasn't enough to give Adam and Eve permanent redemption for salvation. Okay. So, like I say, and the Passover, it was also a reenactment of the Passover that was performed in Egypt by God for the Israelites. After the transgression by Adam and Eve, God himself killed an animal to clothe them, using its blood as payment for their cleansing. In Egypt, every Israelite household would kill an unblemished lamb or goat and spread its blood on the doorpost of their home. When the death angel passed through, any home without this mark would lose the firstborn male of that family. That death angel wasn't looking for people to kill, as many believe. He wasn't looking for the firstborn of Egypt to kill. He was looking for the redeemed to not kill. So the only thing he was looking for was those who believed in God. Those who had a relationship with God, and that was the Israelites. That's why he told them to put the blood on their doorposts and lentils. And listen, if any Egyptian had done that, they would have been saved. Their son would have been saved. Because God is not a respected person. As long as you believe in him and do what he says, he will acknowledge you. So if any e Egyptian had put that blood on their doorposts, their firstborn son would have not died. So like I say, the, the death angel wasn't looking for people to kill. He was looking for those who were redeemed by the blood of that lamb or goat. Okay? So when Jesus came to the earth, he reenacted this process symbolically with the Last Supper as a demonstration of what he would do with his own flesh and blood for all mankind. Like I say, the death angel in Egypt was not looking for people to kill. See, I'm, I'm always getting ahead of myself. I get a little excited. But for the firstborn of the redeemed, from whom he would accept only blood of an unblemished lamb or goat as payment. Any other would automatically die. Jesus on Good Friday was doing the exact same thing, giving himself as a lamb of God, shedding his blood, this time so that anyone who applied his sacrifice to their lives by faith would from that moment on be set free from the bondage of sin and made alive as Adam was before the fall. Now death could only kill the body, but the soul lives on for all eternity in a new body given at his return on Judgment Day. Those who, cho who chose not to receive this gift, just like the Egyptians, would automatically die to all eternity in hell. See, it's the same situation. The death angel was looking for the redeemed. And anybody who had the blood on their doorposts would not die. The firstborn son would not die. But it's the same thing with Jesus. Anybody who receives Jesus' blood on their heart will not die for all eternity. But anyone who does not on that judgment day will die for all eternity. You see, it's the same exact thing. Just slightly different methodology, that's all. This was God doing one of those things he had always done from the beginning and would do it again for the last time. God, listen, everything that God did after Genesis, he did in Genesis. Genesis is the end sample or first example of everything that God, all the, 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 the major moves of God throughout the Bible, all the way to Revelation, they were done first in Genesis, all of them, all of them. Redemption, atonement, salvation, all of those things 
were done. See, because even though no one in the Old Testament received salvation during their lifetime, once they died believing in God, they still received salvation. Okay? Noah, Moses, Samuel, David, Solomon, all those guys died believing in God. They didn't receive salvation at their during their t well they couldn't receive salvation during that time because the payment for sin the qualified payment for sin which was a god hadn't died yet so until jesus who is god came and died for all mankind no man could receive salvation so nobody in the old testament was able to receive salvation instantly like we could today but once Jesus went to that cross, they received salvation too. And on that day, that judgment day, you will see those folks again. Okay? All those guys, those famous guys, Moses and Abraham and them, they, you will see them again. And Adam too. Because he was redeemed too. And he loved God. He never, he never intentionally disobeyed God. Okay? This is the, so enthusiastic says this about what I just said about all the major moves of God first being done in Genesis and then they just re being repeated throughout the Bible. This is what Ecclesiastes says in Ecclesiastes 1 and 9. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And the thing which is done is that which shall be done again. And there is no new thing under the sun. No new thing. Listen, whether we realize it or understand it or not, and this is why you must study God is very predictable. He is very predictable. He makes himself that way. He wants us to know what he's doing when it concerns us. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't hide it. Now, he hid it for a time because he had his reasons for that, but he revealed it eventually. He, he, he hid it for a time because it needed to be taught properly correctly and he had to come to earth to teach that himself because no man had the holy spirit living in them david noah moses solomon none of them could teach it because none of them had the holy spirit living in them they had very little idea about the kingdom they had little little snippets but they didn't truly understand the meat of this message and nobody did until jesus came jesus had to come and teach this himself God had to come and teach this message himself. And he couldn't even teach it until he was 30. When he became, when he was at the age qualified to be a priest. And once he became, he was qualified by age to be a priest. He went and got baptized according to the order that he had given the Israelites. And once he was baptized... John said he saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove. And then his ministry began. So until he got the Holy Spirit in him, the Holy Spirit conceived him, but the Holy Spirit did not live in him. That may be hard for you to understand. The Holy Spirit did not live in him until he was 30. That's why you, we hear nothing about him until he was 30, except for the time when he got lost. And they found him in the temple. And he told them he was, he was in his father's house. He said, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? Because he knew the Holy Spirit gave him the knowledge that he was the son of God. And he knew that. He always knew that. From he was born, he knew he was the son of God. Okay? This is why Jesus conducted the Passover supper before his death, symbolizing what transpired in Eden and in Egypt and, and he, what he was about to do. And we must perpetually with him at this time as the lamb to be slain and what he was about let me read that again this is why jesus conducted the passover supper before his death symbolizing what transpired in eden and in egypt and what he was what he was about to do and we must perpetually with him this time as the lamb to be slain as the atonement of all mankind for the final time in other words he demonstrated how to conduct the Passover supper, and he's telling us, now do this in memory of me. You must always do this. Do this symbol. This is, this is symbolic of what I did for you on the cross. Now I want you 
to take the body and blood, conduct the Passover supper symbolically in my memory. He, telling, he told us that we must always do that, okay, in memory of him. Good Friday in particular was, was a very good day for all mankind. Parallel only to Resurrection Day for reasons I will outline. A great day for mankind indeed, I stated, and should be celebrated. However, it was not a good day for the one who made it possible. It wasn't a good day for Jesus. S still though, you know, he did it out of love. But the one whose personal sacrifice of his own life made available the restoration of divine life back into man, making a living soul of anyone who would receive his offering, endured more than we may understand. What he went through that day, that was frightening for him. You got to understand, he made himself into a man. He had emotions just like us. He, he made himself just like us. So he, 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 he endured all the emotion, all the feelings, all the hurt, the sadness, the happiness, the sorrow, all of it he experienced. He made himself like that intentionally. He wanted to be that way, to experience all of that. He wanted to be us in that way, emotionally. But he was a little, a little, a little better. Not a little, a lot better because he had no sin. He was, he was really better. He was really a God on earth. A God in a man. A God in a man. Which Adam was before the fall. Remember now, Adam was made in the image and likeness of God. In case you keep wondering why I keep saying Adam was a God. Adam, God made Adam like him. Image and like him. Okay? As far as we are made known, it was the worst day of his existence, and he was completely powerless in that moment to restore himself from it. He couldn't suffer. Oh, forgive me. My tag keeps scratching my back of my neck. He suffered greatly, more so in his soul than even the death of his physical being, because in that moment, because of our sin, he, just like Adam, died in the soul. He, he did. You don't believe that? Okay. Keep listening. This is why the Bible tells us that he offered up his life not only for the world, but also for himself as well. Hebrews 7, Hebrews 7, 26 to 27 says, listen carefully now. It was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, blameless, separated from sinners, and exalted higher than the heavens, verse 27, who has no day-by-day -day need like those high priests who offer sacrifices first of all, for his own personal sins, and then for those of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. See? He had to offer up himself for us and for himself, because he took on our sin. So he died for our sins, which were from us, but on him. So he had to die for us and himself. And in doing that, remember now, sin separates man from God. Unless he's redeemed. So in taking on our sin and going to that cross, it separated him from God. It cut him off from God. I don't know it's hard to imagine, but keep listening. And taking on the sin of the world, he became a creature of sin. Not his own, but ours on him nevertheless. And in death experienced the same separation from the Father that Adam experienced. Where he, Adam, lost the presence of the Holy Spirit when he sinned in eating the fruit. This was worse though. In that, the only existence the Son of God had ever known was being one with the Father and the Spirit, as God the Son. And for him... It was like total abandonment, of which he had no control, and for which he cried out. 
Matthew 27 and 46 said, he said, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had to remove himself from him. Because now he was a creature of sin. And God does not have fellowship with any creature of sin that is not redeemed. And he didn't redeem himself yet. He didn't go to the cross yet. He was on the way to sort that out. But in that moment in between, remember the Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried drops of blood. He was in such despair. Because he had only known being one with the Father. And in that moment, he, he was by himself. He had never known being singular never I and mean, can you imagine for him who had only known being part of the trinity for him to now be separated i can't even imagine what does it like listen at least adam still at eve after God left him. Who do you turn to when your father and God himself has left you? This was utter hopelessness. His anguish made him, made his tears as drops of blood, as I just said. Being separated from his father was being separated from himself. Because he was part of the Godhead. And then he got cut off from there. And he had no power to come back from that of himself. I'm telling you all right now. This man suffered. See, a lot of people think because he was God. Oh, he can handle that. He was God. No big, listen. It was even worse than if, if it was you or me or you being killed or going to a cross and get crucified because we wouldn't have known we, we had no idea what it, was, what it was like to be God. But for him who came from an existence that we can't even imagine to now become a, just a human and then all of all that while he knew who he was, and he had a little uh, an attachment to the father, but once he took on our sin, the father cut him off. I mean, this was a part of the assignment. He knew this was going to happen, but he never experienced it before. It was utter dismay. Frightening and a whole other level that is not human. You humans can't imagine that. That would be like someone who has had a relationship with God. See, I can't even I I can't even put that into words because it, it, we don't even know what that's like. It's like someone who would have a, who had a relationship with God all of a sudden feeling abandoned by God. And I know for me, I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Because I right now I can't even recall what it was like without God. Well, before I knew God. That was so long ago. But because I had no idea, no awareness of God then I I, I I didn't know what I was missing. But for me now, to lose God now, knowing what I know, that would that would I I wouldn't want to live I wouldn't want to live. In this world, mm -mm. it'd be hopeless. I might as well just die. Listen, he was all alone in that moment before his death in a way most could never understand. Like a child losing his mother and father at the same time. Not that the father had completely abandoned him, but because of our sin, a price had to be paid. And it separated him from the presence of the Father. 
The father didn't abandon. The father was there. But he had no contact with the father. He was alone. Now from his end, as far as he could feel or tell, he was alone, which he never knew before. Not only alone in that he didn't have someone with him, but his power was gone, his glory was gone. Everything that made him God was gone. I mean, you can't imagine with us, because we were, we were never what he was, or what he is, I should say. This price he had to pay loan. He had to do that by himself. He told us what death implies. Matthew 22 and 32, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jacob is not the God, God is not the God of the dead, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So in that moment that he took on sin, he died. I'm telling y'all, he died in his soul. The same way Adam died in his soul. Just why the Bible says he's a type of Adam. The second Adam. Everything that Adam was, he was. And everything that Adam experienced, he experienced. He died in his soul. Fortunately though, he was the sufficient price that could be paid for its return. But still, once he went down into that grave, he couldn't bring himself back from that. Not without the father. The father had to do that part. When he went down there, he was totally powerless. He gave up his glory for us. To do this job for us. I need you to understand that. You're going to understand how, how much God loves us. He jumped into the abyss. With no hope. For himself. But belief and faith in his father. To return him. What he gave up for us? We have no idea. In dying because of sin at that moment, he became homeless. Without the Father. He had to for our sake because sin cannot exist in the presence of God. Not unredeemed. And he was carrying ours. Not even his own. He did all this for us, for us. Thankfully, he was the necessary price that was needed to be paid for his and our resurrection. It was like, it, it, whether we understand it or not, he was a man while on earth. God in his true identity, yes, but God in man, Emmanuel, for the purpose of salvation made just like the original man, Adam, to save man. That's why he is called the second Adam. He was more Adam than God. <laughs> okay, I, don't, I don't know if you could even wrap your mind around that. It was like the impossible scenario of God walking into the unknown. Because though he was God, he was made into a man for his mission. And in that form, he had surrendered his heavenly power to be a man. But with the Holy Spirit and dominion authority of a sinless man. So all that really did, having the Holy Spirit and dominion authority, is made him even more aware of how serious what he was doing was. Because he had the knowledge of heaven and the knowledge of man on earth. He was God in a man. He understood how serious this was, what he was doing. And it made him cry drops of blood. 
of God in a man. The greatest of all men that ever existed, yes, but he was still a man while on earth, but without sin. He made us in his image originally. He made us in his image originally. It was Jesus who created us, Yeshua. He made us in his image originally when he made Adam. Then in coming to earth, he made himself like us to die so that we could be like him again. He made us in his image originally when he created Adam. He made us like him. Then in coming to earth, he made himself like us so he could die like us. Because he, as God, he couldn't die like us because he's a spirit as God. But he had to put himself in a human form so he could die like us, just like Adam. So that we could again be like him. Because he made us to be like him. That's, how he, that's what he created us to be and he wasn't having nothing else. The scripture says this about man. Listen, Hebrews 2 and 6. But when I testify somewhere saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you graciously care for him? Verse 7. You have made him a little lower than the angels. Listen to that now. You have made him a little lower than the angels. It's talking about man. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And have set him over the works of your hands. Then it says almost the same thing about Christ. One verse after. Verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, crowned with glory and honor. See, same words, same words, because of his suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might experience death for everyone. You see, death is something he had to experience. He never experienced, he, he, he had no idea what that was like. And when he, when he started to approach that, that was scary for him. That was rough. That he might experience death. How do you experience death? Well, see, for him it was an experience because he came back from it. And he's saying to you too, death can, only, can be only an experience for you too. Just an experience. If you are in me, he's saying. If you believe in me and receive me, you shall live again. So death will only be an experience for you too. Are you listening? The father made him just like man so that he would experience everything that man did and die like man as Adam did for the same reason sin. But this time to be resurrected as God because he paid the price for sin that Adam could not. There was no man on earth who could pay this price. That's why no man could receive salvation before he came. Because there was no man on earth that was without sin. But to do this, he had to suffer like a man through death. Can you imagine that he who created death gave it its sting through sin by the power of the law? Now had to submit himself to the very thing that he declared, that the wages of sin is death? To save a man from something he hated? Sin? But because he is love, would not stop himself? Listen, let me tell you something. He didn't have to do it, you know. He didn't have to do it. Love made him do it. Remember now, he started over before. Remember with Noah? He could have started over again. If he wanted to. But no. He wasn't going to do that again. He promised that, that, hurt, that I think that must have hurt him, bothered him, really, really, really bothered him. Because he made a promise that he would never do that again. That must have really taken a lot out of him. Uh, listen, this is God. And no matter what we do, he still loves us. And for him to see all those people die, mind you, they were wicked, evil. They didn't believe in him. They didn't receive him. Like I always tell you. Those people died during Noah's time because, not because they were sinning. God is merciful. His mercy endures forever. 
they died because they didn't believe God. Moses told, God told Moses, tell them, get in this ark. Because I'm going to destroy everything on the earth. Get in the ark. They, they didn't get, they, they, they laughed. They didn't believe God. I think the Bible says Moses was building that ark for over a hundred years. And they wouldn't get in it. Over a hundred years, generations passed. And they didn't believe. That's why they die. And that's why people die in God. Or I should say without God. That's why people go to hell, not because of sin. People go to hell because they don't believe. There's an antidote for sin. His name is Jesus. He suffered on that cross on Good Friday for us. And listen, and even worse, neither could he restore himself from that, that death on the cross. He couldn't come back from that himself. You think I'm, 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 I'm making that up? Listen. Jesus could not bring himself back from death. His trust and belief in his father, which led him to this place of despair, was critical to him being resurrected. He couldn't do it himself. Why do you think he tell us God, we got to be believers? The Bible says he was the first believer. He had to believe and trust in his father and that's to, be, to resurrect him. And he's saying the same thing to us. Trust in me. Believe in me and I will resurrect you. Listen to what it says in John 10, 17-18. For this reason, my, the Father loves me, he said, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. Verse 18. So no one takes it from me, but I lay it down voluntarily. I am authorized and have power to lay it down and to give it up. And I am authorized and have power to take it back. This command have I received from my Father. See that? Now you know if you're authorized, right? You can't authorize yourself. Somebody got to authorize you with greater power than you. The person who authorizes you has to be greater than you. The Father had to give him the power to come out of that grave. The Father did that. He couldn't do it himself. The Father gave him a command. I will resurrect you. You go and do the thing for me and for your brothers. And I will bring you forth out of that grave. You know, grave going to hold you, my son. Hallelujah. You know why I feel so emotional? Because I hear him saying that same thing to me. No grave will hold you, my son. I am the brother of Jesus, and so are you if you believe. And you will be resurrected with him if you die in him. The assignment would push to the limit his faith, if possible, and only because of what he knew, the knowledge given to him by the Holy Spirit, just like all mankind, would, would he have the strength of will to walk into that abyss. Satan celebrated, but Jesus' faith like ours would deliver him. Jesus wasn't unique. Jesus was not unique. There was nothing unique about Jesus. Jesus, we are little Jesus. He, the Bible says, created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. He did. And he made us like him. He didn't make the animals like him. He made man like him. His brothers. That's why we are joint heirs with him. You can only be an heir with a, with another. Only sons could be heirs with sons. Only sons could be a, an heir with the son. Only the children could be heirs. He's an heir. We are joint heirs, the Bible says, because we are also children of the living God. His brothers. That's why he came to earth. To save his brother, brethren. You may be asking why he why did I say he couldn't restore himself? Well, the power he needed to be restored, his glory, 
he voluntarily left in heaven with the Father to perform the sacrificial act of love for people who spat on him, slapped him, beat him to be on recognition of even his own mother. And the only thing he had to say about it was, forgive them. After he had taught and demonstrated the attributes of the kingdom, he requested that the Father restore him to his power once the mission was completed. This is what he said in John 17. I told you all, he didn't have the power to do it. He left his glory in heaven. Listen. John 17, 4-6. He said to the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Verse 5. And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now he's telling the Father, now once I done do this, I done teach him, I done demonstrate it to them by performing the acts of dominion to show them that what is possible. Now I'm going to this cross. Once I have done that, he said, give me back my glory. Give me back my glory. I've been faithful to what you've said. Give it back to me once I've finished this now, Lord. Nevertheless, the despair was still very real. Like a human jumping off a cliff with no parachute but faith. His belief would have to be his safety net. The Bible tells us that he was the originator of this kind of faith. This is why he demands the same of man and promises the same results. Romans 8 and 29 says, For those whom the Father foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he, the son, would simply be the firstborn among many believers. I tell you, he asked us to be believers because he was the first. He had to believe. What he did was an act of faith. That wasn't an act of, 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 of power. That was an act of faith. He reduced himself to us. He left his power. I just read the, the scripture for you. He left his glory. He told the Father, now give me back my glory once I finish this. He wasn't used to, he didn't like being without it. He wanted it back. Because that's all he knew. He probably felt naked with all his power, with all his glory. But he trusted the Father. That level of faith he's saying, if you just have just a, just a, just as, as, as small as a grain of mustard seed, he says. Because that's all he needed. And he was resurrected back to life. Fully God. And when he came back to life, he breathed on them just like God. Breathed just like he did with Adam. Same thing all over again. Belief, faith came from him and was demonstrated by him at the uttermost to be the antidote to death itself and any other obstacle to our destiny in him. Faith. Faith overcomes everything. 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 You hear me? The Bible tells us that God, nothing is impossible as long as you believe. Nothing. Because we are God's Listen, many want the power he has, but it takes great faith, even a tiny fraction. Believe and you shall succeed in all things, he tells us, and then perform belief for all to see to the uttermost success. Restoration to full Godship. He offers the same thing to man, the power to be God's again. John 1 and 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He is saying, In me is power. To be like Adam was a God at his creation, full dominion. Just believe and you will never fail again according to my will. I suffered so that you as my brethren would not. I died so you could live. I am God again so that you can be God as, again as well. A God again as well. Because, because for you to have dominion again, you must be a God. Only gods can be godly. And only gods can have dominion. The Bible says all dominion and power was his. All authority is his. And he gave that power to God. He told God one day, he said, The glory you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one. I and you, them in me, one. 
He wants us to get to be one again with him. All part of one. God don't like being separated from his children. He created us to be like him and with him. In fellowship with him. Constantly. Continuously. Perpetually. Forever. Listen. For those of you who still don't believe you are God. Most humans cannot accept this fact, you know, that they are gods. For lack of faith and understanding of the word. Jesus prophesied through King David. This is what he said. Psalm 82, 5 to 7. He said, they know not. Talking about us now. He said, they know not. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness as ignorance. He said, all the foundations of the earth are cursed. Out of course, he meant cursed. That's when he became cursed when Adam sinned. Verse 6, he said, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. This is Jesus talking. Who made you, telling you you're a God, and you can't receive it. <laughs> he said, but you should, but listen to this now. Verse 7, he said, but you shall die like a man. Because you don't know who you are. And fall like one of the princes. The princess being Satan and his angels. He said, you are God. You are, you are a God, but you're going to die like a man. Because you don't know. You're rejecting the knowledge I'm giving you. And, and you, you can't receive it. You can't believe it. You let what people tell you cause you to reject this knowledge. Instead, you come to my word and find it for yourself. And come to me. So I can guide you through my word. Have a relationship with me. You listening to people and letting them tell you things and fill your head up with stuff. That ain't true. That I didn't tell them to tell you. Teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. They're teaching their opinion. And you think it's my doctrine because you're not studying. So you don't know the difference. You just go to church and listen. You don't read. You don't study. You don't meditate. If you meditate on this word, you will see the truth. So that's Good Friday. Now that brings us to Resurrection, Sunday. The downfall of man occurred in Eden because of the greatest error that has ever been committed by the first human being. That human, created as a god by God's breathing into him the breath of life, lost that divine life that existed in his soul. Remember God said, the Bible said he breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul? That, that's when he became a god. When he had written, inadvertently committed a transgression by breaking the only law he was given by God, to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Though he was not the first to commit this transgression, Eve was. The entire demise of mankind occurred by his action. Why? Because God only breathed into him. You see? His disposition of being a God carried the ability to pass down whatever was in him down to his race. It wasn't an Eve. God didn't breathe in the Eve. Eve couldn't pass that down. But because he had the Holy Spirit in him, he was made into a God. It was in him to pass it down to his race. So if he didn't sin, he would have passed down the ability to be gods automatically to all of us. All of us would be walking around right now as gods. Not even walking. We'd probably be flying now. Excuse me? With God, anything is possible. Didn't the Bible say that they saw Jesus rising in flesh and blood? Think. Or I should say, study. <laughs> See, you would know these things if you read this Bible and study it properly. So, though he was not the first, uh, I, I just read that. By one man, it changed the trajectory of the world, and by one man it would have to be corrected. Romans 5, 14-15 says, Yet death ruled from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned as Adam did. Adam is a type of him who was to come. See, Adam passed down sin to us, even though we didn't break the law that he break. Because no one could have break that law in, anymore because God put him on the garden and that was it. And put a flaming sword there so nobody could go back in that garden. As a matter of fact, that was the presence of God so no one could get in there unless God allowed them in there. But 
though we didn't commit the same sin he did, he passed the sinful nature to us, his children. And so, all of us have it. Because, like I said, he was a God. Verse 15, but the, tree, the free gift is not like the trespass, meaning Jesus is not like Adam in that sense. Okay, he's like Adam. Adam, is, you see what it says here? Yet death ruled from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned as Adam did. Adam is a type of him who was to come. They're saying Adam and Jesus was very similar. He was a type in a sense. Okay, Jesus came as Adam, but without sin. You see? So that's why it says in verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by one man's trespass, that's Adam, much more did God's grace and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus, overflow to the many. So Adam passed down sin to us. The second Adam came to take away that sin. That's all that is saying. The second Adam came as, see, when Adam sinned, he lost his Godship. So God came as God and man, what what Adam was before the transgression, God and man. Adam was God and man before the transgression. So God and man came back to earth to undo what the first God and man did. And that was the only one who could do that because if one God died, one God and man died, another God and man had to come to die for what the, God and, the first God and man did. And that's why he came. Because of Adam's sin, he died in his soul. And since that day, all men are born dead because of it. We are all born dead because Adam died in his soul, not physically. He lived to be almost a thousand years, but he was a dead God. All that time, he was dead. Because he couldn't be redeemed, perfectly redeemed, until Jesus came to the earth to die on that cross. But he did, because he confessed his sin to God. Remember when God reproached him and Eve and asked them what happened? They both confessed. And that's why he killed that animal, gave them the skin to clothe them in mercy, because of the scripture that says, um, uh, God is faithful and just to forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And they, they confessed, and God forgave them. So, I can say all men are born dead now. The divine life of the word, in the, the divine life the word had placed in him via the Holy Spirit left him. And, and, and he, as the progenitor or the originator of his race, passed down the same disposition to mankind. Man was alive in his humanity, physically, or is alive in his humanity, but dead in his soul. That's why Jesus came back to give us back life in our soul. Remember what he said? Though you are dead, yet shall you live. Immortality and dominion was lost, iniquity found. So the nature of sin come on all of us. But as far as the Father was concerned, this could not stand. Mm -mm. Because he had already declared that man would have dominion. That's what, once that came, left his mouth, that could not be permanently stopped. Now there's a tricky part to that. The dominion spoken upon him by his creator could not be permanently stopped. It left, once it left the mouth of God, it would have to come to pass. Because of the divine declaration of, the, of dominion for man in Genesis 1 and 26. Remember what God said? Let us make man in our image and likeness. So once that left God, his mouth, nothing could stop that. Man would be in the image and likeness of God. Now, the problem was that God's declaration that he would surely die if he ate from the, from the forbidden tree also could not be stopped. Hmm, that's a dilemma. So on the one hand, the, direct, the declaration that man would be made in the image and likeness of God could not be stopped. But on the other hand, if you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. That could also not be stopped. 
because God spoke both of them. So how do you get around that? Let me tell you something. Only God can overcome that. Only God have enough, I don't know what they call it, divine intelligence to even know how to deal with that. So, both were spoken from the mouth of God, and anything he speaks does what he declares. A change would be needed. An undoing of Adam's mistake, if you will, an action to return man to his God status before the transgression. A rebirth of his soul from death back to life. A God died, and a God would have to die again to pay for that mistake. That's why he came. A resurrection. So, God is saying, look, the only way you're going to get this life I, I told you you're going to die. But I also say you're going to be in my image, not just like me. And I can't die. So, that mistake you made, I, somebody got to die for that. And since you were a God, a God has to die. Y'all get it now? So, a God had to come to earth to die for you and me. Tell you all this was no this was no simple thing, no easy thing. Okay? John eleven twenty five said unto John eleven twenty five says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So your man is dead, born dead. What Jesus the Christ would perform on that cross and three days later was not primarily for him. But it was by necessity for him too. Not only because the Father had ordained that man be brought back to life he had given him, but he would have to be the one who would pay the price of death according to the law that was required for sin, because a sinless man, which is a God, was needed, and there existed no man of that disposition on earth. Like I told you, here is that law. Romans 6 and 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He became what we were, so we could become who He is. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in Him. By taking on man's sin, His sacrifice became necessary for Himself as well as for man, so that He could be reborn fully as God. He had to die for us and for Himself. And and any man who received him become gods again as well. So he didn't. So when he died, he didn't die just for him to be resurrected and 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 become God again. He died so we could become resurrected and become gods again. Not just to have life, but to be a god again. We were gods. We are gods. But you see, the problem is, is that though we are still gods. The one who makes it gives us the awareness of that. See, we are gods. Like I read that scripture used for Psalm 82, 5 to 7. He says, you are gods, but because you don't know, you're walking in darkness, you can be a god. Because you don't know what that means. You have no idea, no knowledge of what that is. See, knowledge is everything. That's why God told the Israelites, for lack of knowledge, you're being destroyed. I've given you all these laws to show you how to be successful in everything. And you're disregarding it. You're disregarding it. You're ignoring it. How are you going to overcome if you don't listen to the overcomer? i given you the laws you need to obey so that you can never be defeated. If they Listen, if, if the Israelites had obeyed every single law God gave them, they would have never been defeated. Never. Couldn't be. Remember now, God had them winning battles while they were sleeping. He was fighting for them. So, by taking on man's sin, his sacrifice became necessary for himself as well as for man. I said that. Uh, so, in resurrecting him, the first believer, the father was demonstrating his willingness to resurrect every person who would believe in him. This is what happened the instant he died on the cross. Matthew 27, 52-53 says, And the graves were opened, 
and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. You know who that was? That was Moses, Aaron and them, Samuel, Solomon, David. That was them. Let me read it again. And the graves were opened. This is when he died. The instant that he died, the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Y'all heard me? All them old boys, <laughs> Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Haggai, Daniel, my God, Paul, Peter, Matthew, James, John, all these guys came out of the grave and others. Verse 53, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. This was no secret thing. They went in the open where people could see them and see the evidence of this man, the power of his blood to raise the dead. It was no secret. This wasn't hidden. The reinfusion of life by his blood was so powerful that many humans who had died believing in God since the creation of the earth, I think where Adam and Eve was even in that, resurrected to salvation from him. Even those who passed away before his death on the cross, and it is still raising the dead to life today. From then until today, and, 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 and everlasting, until he comes again. And will until he comes again, they literally become gods again sons of God, brothers of the begotten Son, with dominion power from on high as it was with Adam. John 1 and 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This was God's plan all along, to restore his prodigal son, man, back to the family of God where he belongs crowned with glory and honor God thinks so listen God thinks so highly of you viewer you have no idea and I hope you do now though God thinks so much of you see we, we, we if we truly study and understand what God thinks of us see we, we always get uh, caught up in the the, the fascinating stories of God punishing people and stuff like that, right? But listen, don't don't just dwell on that. Dwell on, on the things he did for us and the promises he gave. Sometimes God got to do what he got to do so that we get the right message. He got, he's laying down on Sodom and Gomorrah because he wants to know, you see this? I hate this. This right here? It will interrupt my plan for man. And I can't let that happen. It wasn't that he thought that was sin was greater than any other sin, you know. It was just that that was, was, was a, 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 a... See, God's, like I tell you, God's plan for the earth has to come through the family. That's how we have it set up. Through a man and a woman and their children. That's God's plan for the earth. That's how it comes through. That's how he, That's why he started off with the family. Adam and Eve and their children. But uh, two homosexuals can't produce no family. So they are a threat to God's plan. Not that he hates them any more than any other sin. What they doing any more than any other sin. He doesn't hate them, but their sin. And he did at that time, then... Because he wanted us to know, listen, don't engage in this. This is a threat to me. I don't see this as greater than any sin, but it's a threat to what I want to do, what I'm doing. And for that reason, I will act. Anything that gets in my way of what I'm doing, see, I could look at some sins and I could... The Bible says he winked at certain things. That's, that's in the Bible. 
And he, 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 you know, he, he saw it, man. And he said, okay, your judgment going to come later. But this one, he said, no, I can deal with this now. This homosexuality. Because this interferes with the family. And the family is my divine creation. Everything, see, I call myself father. I'm a family man. Don't interfere with my family plan. Because then I got to act. And let me tell you, this mess that's going on right now, God might get ready to act again soon. We might see something that we didn't expect. Remember now, he didn't say he wouldn't do that again. He told us he wouldn't rain flood. But if a certain nation keep doing what they're doing, and become the symbol for this thing, this homosexuality movement. If they continue in that way, he may have to act to make an example of them. So make sure you're on the right side. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay? Like I said now, you know, no sin is greater than the other. All is sin. But God already showed us that he reacts to certain sin differently. And for his own reasons. Okay? Uh, like I say, he, this is God's plan all along to restore his prodigal son, man, back to the family of God where he belongs. That's what the, prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son was all about. Us, and, and us, we were the son, and the, the man, the daddy, was, the, was him, the father. To be what he was created to be, a God for God. If only we could come to know and understand this fact. Because until we do, we cannot be saved. Because it was declared by the king. And we must believe the king if we ought to receive a salvation. So if you don't believe you're a God, I don't know what to tell you. How are you going to be saved? If the king said it and you can't receive it, he said, you got to believe me, you got to receive me. Listen, he said it then to King David and Psalms, and he said it again in the New Testament. The Jews were about to stone Jesus one day because he declared that he and the Father are one. That they were both God. This is what happened. John 10, 32 to 36. Jesus, they, 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 they pick up stones to stone him. They were so mad that he was calling himself God. Jesus said, Jesus answered them and said, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you wish to stone me? Jesus was saying, I do nothing bad, but why you want to stone me? They said, the Jews answered them saying, For a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Because that thou being a man, makes thyself God. Verse 34, Jesus answered them and said, and he was referring to the same scripture I just read to you all in Psalm 82, 5 to 7. He said, is it not written in your law, the law that I gave you, I say you are God? And he went on to say in verse 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, he was saying the scripture is real, authentic. He, verse 36, he say, Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified, meaning himself, and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said, I am the Son of God. He was telling them, You mad, because I said, I am the Son of God. But didn't I tell you that you are also a God? I, God, declared in your Bible, the book, you, the scripture you have, that I made you like me. And it says in there that I say, ye are gods, and you man, because I say, I'm the son of God. You see how people can be religious? Listen to me, those of you who are watching me. There's a true man of God, and then there's a religious man. People who believe whatever, don't study, 
Don't devote themselves to knowing what this word means. Don't devote themselves to relationship, to obeying God, doing what he said. Because only through your obedience to God will God have fellowship with you and teach you the truth. Even if you're reading this Bible and you ain't following it, he will still not fellowship with you. You can read this as much as you want to. If you're not doing what it says, submitting yourself to it, he can't fellowship with you. He will not teach you what it means. He know your heart ain't with him. You ain't for him. Don't be like these Pharisees and scribes. Because they, they, they read the Bible plenty now. They, they read the scripture plenty. Not the Bible, the scripture. Because there was no Bible then. They read, they read the Old Testament scriptures. Okay, they knew it well. That's why he said, didn't it say in your scripture? See, is it not written in your law? I said, yeah, God, this is the law he gave now. He gave them this law. Is it not written in your law? I said, yeah, God. See, well, well and, 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 if, and if I call on you a God, who I give my word to, why are you upset that I say I'm a God? That I am God, sorry. That I am God. I'm the one who made you a God and tell you that you are God. And you're mad because I say I'm, I'm God. You see how messed up religious religiosity could make you? You can't, you, 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 you call yourself, uh, uh. These were experts. Call themselves experts in scripture. And they didn't understand what it meant when he said, ye are gods. And this is the same thing that men doing today. When I tell people that they are gods, that Jesus said they are gods, they laugh. I've heard people say, now watch it now, watch it now, watch it now. Don't say that. Don't say, don't say it like that. He don't mean it like that. What do you mean he don't mean it like that? What do you think he mean? study even more so have relationship submit yourself God said unless you submit yourself as little children to my word you shall not see the kingdom of God that means that whatever God says just like a child does when a child listen to a parent a small child Whatever their parents say, they do. They receive. That's who they learn from. They absorb. They don't just rehear it. They will absorb it. That's what he's saying. Absorb what I say into you. Make it a part of who you are. Let it become part of you. Only then can you truly become a child of God. A son of God. I receive everything. Listen, if God said it, I receive it. That's good enough for me. I don't care who around me, my pastor, I don't care who. I'll tell him he don't know what he's talking about. I don't care who it is. If God says it, I don't care who's standing over me telling me something different. I can't hear them. If it ain't in here, in this Bible, brother, you ain't talking to me. But you know a lot of people ain't like that. There are literally people who will believe whatever their pastor says, even though they see something in the Bible that's different. And they will believe the foolishness that people tell them over the Word of God that they read in every day. Blind leading the blind. And that's what these Pharisees and scribes was doing. They were, he tell them, it's in your scripture. You, and yet you can't receive it. He was telling them, it's in the scripture you say you're an expert in. So watch it. Be careful. Religiosity is a serious thing. It can mess you up. Know the truth. Study. Have relationship. Jesus said we are gods because he still sees us as he made man. Gods. As far as he was concerned, manifesting that again was only a cross away. And that's what he came to do. 
return us to that status? The earth remains out of course since Adam caused the curse to be on her, meaning he lost his dominion. And neither will we have no dominion or her curse lifted before and until the children of God have returned to their rightful place into the glorious freedom of God by accepting what he has said about us. Romans 8, 19 to 21 says this about the earth. For creation waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed. Verse 20. For the creation was subject to frustration and futility. You hear that? The earth is alive. She was subjected to frustration. Only something alive could be frustrated. Not willingly, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Verse 21. That the creation itself will also be freed from its bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of the children of God. You see that? That the creation itself will also be freed from its bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Let me tell you what that means. When God made Adam, God declared, you shall have dominion over the earth. That means your relationship with the earth is that you will rule her. And the earth heard it. The earth heard it. I tell you, the earth is alive. She knew then, instantly, who her master was. Not God. God gave mastery of the earth to man. Dominion, rulership. So, when Adam sinned, the Bible, God told him, you shall surely die. So, when he sinned, he died. Instantly, because of his relationship with the earth, because he was, his connection with her was so tight and so ordained by God that she died too. See ya? That the creation itself would also be freed from its bondage to decay. He died. And instantly, she began to die. Because her master, her ruler, her dominator died. That's, let me tell you, let me tell you something here. Yeah? When God speaks, what he says is so powerful. His words, they perform what he says. The instant he, he ate that fruit, the earth went into a convulsion, the Bible says in Romans. And she went through a period of frustration and, fruit, fruit, and, and futility. And pain as in childbirth, this is in the Bible. The earth is alive, she is our mother. We came from her. Everything that's alive came from her. That's why God calls himself Father. We have a mother. An original mother. The earth. And she began to die. When man died, she died. The same time she began to die. See? From its bondage to decay. She decayed. She died. And she is waiting now. For man, see, say, for the creation was subject to frustration of, and, fu and f was subjected to frustration and futility, not willingly, but by the will of Him, God, who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will also be freed along with man, because I say, see what it says in, in the first verse, for creation waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed, for us to come back to God, so that she could be free. That the creation itself will also be freed from its bondage into decay, into the glorious freedom of the children of God. She's waiting for us to be returned. That's see. <laughs> that's why you gotta study. The stuff is right there in front of your face, and but you will never see it if the Holy Spirit don't reveal it to you. By believing and receiving every word that came from the mouth of God, His word is our true sustenance, our lifeblood, the bread of life. Believing is not simply repeating words with your mouth like Jesus is Lord. The word Lord means owner. 
It means that if he is your Lord, he now owns your will and intent. And every action you commit concerning any issue is influenced by what he said about that issue. It also means that everything he says in this word becomes your life's philosophy. The reason for every decision. It means knowing what he says concerning your very existence and living accordingly. You don't just say Jesus is Lord and then go about your business. If Jesus is your Lord, then he's, he, he, you do what he says. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You'll do what I say. There are many people who say they say, but they don't do nothing God tell them to do. You just, y'all, y'all keep playing. Keep playing. And I ain't judging nobody. I know. Because I was like that too. I had to fix myself. Thank God he gave me the grace and mercy to do that. Because I was saved and still smoking though. Still doing crap. Mm. Professing Christianity. I had to fix that. I had to fix that. And you can fix it too. Make it right. Because salvation, eternity, is too big to miss. It's too big, man. If you come to understand what it's truly about, it's too big. If he says something about you, no matter how unbelievable, unbelievable it may seem, at a certain point in your walk with him, you must receive it, or you will never be a true believer. It's what it says in James 1, 5 to 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given him. See? Relationship. Verse 6. But he must ask in faith. Without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a, verse 8, being a double-minded man, unstable and restless in all his ways. God is saying, if you believe, you better believe. Show me your belief. He says, there is no faith without works. The scripture says, faith without works is dead. Meaning, if you say you're a believer, then do what I say. If you're not doing what I say, you're not a believer. That's, that's what the word is saying. So you could say, I'm a Christian, 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 a million times a day. If you're not doing what the Bible says that Jesus said that you're supposed to do, he is saying, you're not with me. God may allow a new convert to make fundamental mistakes, but once that individual comes to know the word and does not practice it, they become double-minded as far as he is concerned. His word is, is not just what we read. It is God. And he came and dwelt among us to give us the bread of life, the divine food of life everlasting. Listen what it says in this, this, in this important scripture, John 6 and 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. He's saying, look here. Ignore his flesh. It's your spirit I'm concerned with. He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit, and they are life. So don't ignore them. They will change you if you receive them. Your entire life. If you don't ignore them, they are life, he said, my words. I tell you, when God speaks, <laughs> you better listen and receive them. When you read what he says, when he gives instructions, start doing them immediately. When we hear and receive the wisdom of the word of God, we don't just receive good advice. We literally receive life back into our soul, making us gods again. He originally, as he originally created us to be. Rise, my brother, my sister, 
and declare and live your rightful place in God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you have received him, who is your resurrection, then know that you are no longer dead, but born over or again alive in him to become God's sons of God again. So take this thing seriously. What he did that long weekend was a great personal sacrifice for him. And you better not play around with it. I'm glad he raised me up to teach you this. Because this is something you need to understand. And on that great getting up morning, I'm sorry, it'll be too late. And don't think you're going to wait until you get old, because these days, you don't know when death is coming. I'm not speaking no death over nobody. But you just don't know. Tomorrow is not promised. Make your election sure today. Do it now. And it's not about, listen, listen, listen. Let me tell you something, yeah? It's not about just saying a sinner's prayer. It's more than that. You can't just say something, say a little prayer, and think that makes me saved. No, this is a hard thing. It's a devotion thing. It's a knowledge thing. You got to learn what God said. You got to spend time with Him so you can understand what God said. And then you got to live it. Salvation requires a response, a life change. It's too great to miss. It's everything. This little tree score and ten ain't nothing. So, I thank you for bringing me into your household today. And please listen to this again as many times as you can. Share it with your friends. Share it with people. Help them to understand that's ministry. That's you doing ministry. He said, take the message, you know. This is a part of the message. This is how you take it. You share it. So God bless you. And we'll be together again next week. God's best life. Be careful out there on this holiday Monday. Be safe. Watch the water. Watch your children. Watch the streets. You know how we go around here. We like the party. So be careful, okay? And God bless you and make you make your pathway safe. Bring you home safe and keep you. Okay? God bless you. I will see you next week. Bye-bye.